Welcome back everybody and I hope you enjoyed your lunch break. We will now hear our second ministerial address of the day. This time, Minister of State with Responsibility for Disability, Miss Anne Rabbit, has provided us with a pre-recorded address giving information around the drafting and submission of Ireland's initial state report to the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I hope you enjoy her message. Thank you. Hello everyone, and I hope that you are all well. It is my pleasure to be with you here today in order to speak at my second NDA annual conference as Minister for Disability. I would like to thank Dr. Aideen Hartnett, Director of the National Disability Authority, for extending the invitation to me to speak today at this very worthwhile and informative event. I might take this opportunity, if I can, to thank the board and staff of the NDA. I want to acknowledge and recognise the quality of the work, the advice and the analysts on the disability issues that you have so constantly provided, not just to me and to officials in my department, but also to my government colleagues, a sincere thank you. I know that my colleague, Minister O'Gorman, spoke to you this morning regarding how the government is moving forward on the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act. In light of that, I will focus on the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, on the development of our initial state report and how we are reporting on Article 12. I published the draft state report in December last year, which marked the start of a detailed public consultation process. That consultation has had a number of different strands, ensuring that my department has heard from as many people as possible. A particular effort was made to ensure that the voices and views of people with disabilities and their representative organisations were at the fore. My department held three accessible online public consultation events in March and April this year. These were attended by individuals and organisations from all over the country and my department sought direct feedback on the draft state report on a thematic basis. A detailed report on the contributions made by attendees was produced and this has informed the final state report. The newly established Disability Participation and Consultation Network were also tasked with carrying out consultations on the draft report amongst its own membership. It ran seven online sessions and produced a report on this consultation that ensured that 200 more people and organisations with lived experiences of disability had the opportunity to feed into the state report. Over 70 detailed written submissions were received from organisations and individuals. Finally, my department engaged directly with children, including children with disabilities, to hear directly what they had to say about their experience on their rights in Ireland. This work was a joint effort to inform not only the UNCRPD state report, but also my department's reporting on the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Universal Periodic Review. Those consultations prove very valuable generally, but in the specific context of persons with disability also serve to highlight how important the text of the Convention is in terms of impacting positively on the everyday lives of people with disabilities. The very strong feedback from the consultations was that Article 12 is central to the delivery of all of the rights set out in the Convention. It provides for a fundamental shift in the thinking, and that is the key to the real implementation of the UNCRPD. It highlights the need to change how we conceptualise disability and to empower people with disabilities to exercise proper control over their own daily lives and affairs. As you might imagine, the strong message from participants in all of the consultations was one of frustration with the delays in making the fundamental changes required and the commencing of the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act. I have heard that message and I know that Minister Gorman has too. As Minister for Disability, I hear that message as I meet people with disabilities and their families across the country. Minister O'Gorman and I are committed to moving forward on this. The impacts of the assisted decision making will be far reaching and because of the scale of the reform in the, this jurisdiction, we do need to ensure that while we are pushing forward, we are also making certain what we deliver is ultimately of real benefit to those who need it. 
Because of this, it is so important. We need to get it right and we will get it right. Alongside this, the feedback from the consultation events and the written submission highlighted other issues around Article 12. Those who participated called for reforms in other areas such as mental health and the deprivation of liberty safeguards to ensure the wider implementation of the article. Others saw the ratification of the UNCRPT as an opportunity to engage in a detailed consideration of how our mental health and criminal law procedures and processes operate and how they could be improved in light of the UNCRPD approach. Education and awareness training was highlighted, primarily for those professionals who will play a role when the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act is commenced. But also in terms of addressing the difficulties people with disabilities experience in accessing the justice system generally. Those with disabilities feel that the justice system cannot and does not support them. Participants recommended that the provision of training in disability issues for those working at all levels in this sector to ensure that when someone with a disability does need to engage with the legal system, that they feel supported and assisted in doing so. I feel awareness raising is critical, not just for the justice sector, but for all public servants and indeed for public more generally. The feedback from the consultations was so rich and I am grateful to everyone who participated in them. Unfortunately, we are hampered in reflecting that fully in the final state report by the UN reporting guidelines around format and word count. Even so, the consultations and the response have provided a wealth of information that underscores just how critical Article 12 is in our country's step-by-step -step journey to full CRPD implementation. I wanted to take the opportunity today to share some of that with you and to thank many of you here who no doubt took part in some way in those consultations. It is important that you take the time to participate. My department and I value your contributions very much. I was hoping to be in a position today to confirm submission of the state report to the UN. Even though I cannot yet do that just yet, I know that the stage will be completed very shortly. We will then await notification of an appearance date with the UN committee in the future. I hope that the state can now show significant progress in our Article 12 obligations between now and that appearance. Finally, I am very impressed by the programme for today's events and the high calibre of experts, including experts with lived experiences that you will be hearing from today. I look forward to the outcome of today's conference and working with you all in the future to implement Article 12 here in Ireland. Thank you. Many thanks again to Minister Rabbit for taking the time to record and send us that message in what we all appreciate was a very busy week for government. And it is very positive to hear that the first state party report from Ireland is so close to completion and submission. I am now going to hand over to Eleanor Flynn, who is Director of the Centre for Law, Disability Law and Policy at NUIG, and she's going to chair our second panel discussion of the day. Several jurisdictions are ahead of us when it comes to supported decision making, some in terms of legislation and policy and others in terms of practice. So we're now going to hear from three such jurisdictions, England and Wales, Sweden, and the US. So I welcome Alex, Mats and Jonathan here today and thank them for sharing their time and their experience. Again, you can submit any questions you have for the panelists through the Q&A function and Eleanor will moderate a, 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 some of those questions and answers when the panel discussion comes to its close. So now over to you, Eleanor. Thank you very much, Aideen. Delighted to be with you all today and to be chairing a panel with such excellent expertise on our topic for today's discussion. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first panellist for this afternoon session, Alex Rockeen, who is a very experienced barrister, writer and educator. Many of you may know of Alex's work at the 39 Essex Chambers, particularly their Mental Capacity Law Report, which is really recognised as the Bible for many legal practitioners in this field. 
Uh, Alex is also a Welcome Research Fellow and Visiting Professor at King's College London, has also been a research affiliate at the Essex Autonomy Project, um, has worked with the Law Commission of England and Wales, and most recently was a Special Advisor to the Joint Committee on Human Rights of the Westminster Parliament for their inquiry into the human rights implications of the government's response to COVID-19. So welcome to Alex. You have 15 minutes to present, and I believe you have a PowerPoint presentation you want to share. So I'll come back on the screen with about two minutes to end of your presentation. That'll be a prompt for you, Alex, to start wrapping up. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you so much <clears throat> for the invitation to speak. I feel really honoured to be asked to speak amongst such an incredibly expert panel. Um, I need to make it very, very clear that I approach my task with humility, um, not least because of a traditional um, a traditional problem with people from England coming to tell people from Ireland what to do. I would never dream of doing that. I would also, I think it's really important to say, I would never ever want to undertake an exercise in comparative law like this, which I love doing. I would never want to take, undertake an exercise in comparative law by saying we've got it right in England and Wales. What I really want to do is share some experiences Apart from anything else, for you to go, those are traps we might want to think about or traps we might want to avoid. So I'm hoping I'm framing this in the right way. I think it's important just to give you a kind of orientation in time and place to understand where I'm coming from. So I'm talking about a legislation, legislature, England and Wales which is not the same as Scotland and not the same as Northern Ireland. I'm talking about the legislation which applies in England and Wales here. There's different legislation in those other two jurisdictions. I'm talking about the Mental Capacity Act 2005. And I've just put on screen a really short summary. I will put into the chat function later if people are interested where you can find more detail. But what we've essentially got is an act which has got five statutory principles. Three, thinking about the concept of capacity. Two, thinking about the concept of best interests. We then have got a test of capacity which looks quite a lot like yours in the Assisted Decision Making Act with one major difference. Our test is a functional test. Can the person understand, retain, use and weigh the information relevant to the decision? And if they can, can they communicate their decision? The difference between our test and your test is if the person can't do that, understand, retain, use and weigh the information or communicate the decision, we need to ask why. And a person can only lack capacity for purposes of our act in England and Wales if the reason they can't do that is because they have a disturbance or impairment in the functioning of the mind or brain. I should make it clear that doesn't have to be permanent. It could be temporary. It could be the after effect of having been knocked over off your bicycle say. We then have best interests, and I know your act very, very deliberately does not use the term best interests, and I'm aware that it's a term which has got many meanings for different people. In England and Wales, at least, the way it's really understood, following a Supreme Court decision, so our top court decision, called Aintree and James, and when you get these slides, these are live hyperlinks out, so you can link directly to the case. Our Supreme Court case has identified that best interests is a test which really focuses, focuses on wishes, feelings, beliefs, and values. So ultimately it's meant to be an objective test, but it starts with, as people always say, standing in the shoes of the person. Our act provides for graded informality. There's a specific mechanism which enables care and treatment to be delivered to someone who isn't able to consent to that individual intervention at that point in time. It's not a formal removal of legal capacity, but it's essentially a workaround for the person being unable to give consent. We could have an interesting discussion about how close that comes to removing legal capacity there. We then have a specialist court, the Court of Protection. Ellen has mentioned the report we do in my chambers and we frequently make reference to decisions of the Court of Protection because we're unusual, I think, in fact, I know we're unusual in having a specialist court with a big body of reported cases here, which provides you with some good material to go, don't do that, or possibly do do that. 
and we've got the formal ability to make advanced decisions in different ways. We've also got a statutory code of practice, which is under revision at the moment, reflects, well, I say 15 years of experience. Our act has been in force for 14 years, but we had a kind of year beforehand where we even knew it was coming, or we were preparing. And I should say I'm involved in, in the, the revision of that statutory code. So that's the orientation in time and place. And so I wanted to then turn to tell four cautionary tales for you from our experiences. And I really want to emphasize, this is me trying to say, think carefully. It is not me saying, do this or don't do that. So the first cautionary tale I called misreading the moral compass of capacity. We have a presumption of capacity, a statutory presumption that the person has capacity. We also have a statutory presumption that the mere fact the person makes an unwise decision should not be taken as evidence or to not be taken as a, as a the sole basis to find they don't have capacity. Two hugely important presumptions. What we've found in different ways, in different times over the last 14 years is that can be very badly misused and capacity can be weaponized, be made a weapon against people to say you've got capacity, for instance, to decide to take your own life, capacity to decide to self-harm, or it's a lifestyle choice you're making to live in conditions of serious squalor and what anybody else would identify as self-neglect. We're not going to intervene. And there are really very serious questions there about whether sometimes that capacity presumption, those two capacity presumptions, are being used against people to deny them support. So I just want you to think about that. The second is that there is, I think, and I want to flag this, the risk of a new kind of paternalism when we move to focus so intently on wishes and feelings or will and preferences. I'm not for one second saying it's not incredibly important to do that. But that Barnsley Hospital NHS Trust and MSP is a very recent example of a case where you may think we need to be careful here. Because in that case, the judge constructed the decision on behalf of the person that they wouldn't wish to continue life sustaining treatment. And he constructed that decision on the basis of evidence about what he would have wanted. And a very large part of that evidence centered around what he was said to have said and done at a point before he lost capacity about whether or not he would want a stoma. So in other words, something to support his digestive system inserted. And if you look at that case, I would ask you to read it for yourself and ask if that decision is being made on his behalf, to stop life-sustaining treatment on the basis of that's what he would have wanted, how comfortable are you that enough evidence is there as to whether that really is the case? I'm just giving you an example of a situation where very important to construct decisions around people's will and preferences. We do need to be very, we need to have a proper, I suggest, standard against which you can ask that question. You also need to check where is this evidence coming from? How much are people potentially projecting what they want onto what the person wants when we're into best interpretation of will and preferences territory? So that's an important cautionary tale I'd suggest. The third cautionary tale is that, remember, it's not just about your legislation about capacity. That Supreme Court case of N and ACCG really made that point very clearly to us in England and Wales. Because that made it very clear that decisions on a best interest basis, so under our Mental Capacity Act, could only be made between options which were actually available to the person with impaired decision making. So the second you think that, or you realise that, the second you realise that an awful lot turns on who is putting options on the table. Under what, on what basis are they doing it? 
Can you have courts compelling public bodies to provide things? Can you get courts to compel a doctor to provide a treatment they don't think is medically appropriate? In England and Wales, the answer is no, but it does mean it's really important, very important to have legislation thinking about how do we address the situation where the person can't make their own decision, but that sits in a much bigger place. And my last cautionary tale is that slightly odd phrase at the bottom, and I'm kind of fascinated to see the sign language here, legal lobster pot. So in other words, a lobster pot is a trap. A lobster can get into the pot very easily, but can't get itself out. And what we've discovered is we've asked lots and lots of questions in England and Wales through the lens of mental capacity law to which we where we've come up with answers and we're going we don't know what to do with that answer and we're not entirely sure we should have asked that question so can i just give that example is that a local authority and jb i can't i've got to be careful what i say about this case because it's before the our supreme court at the moment they've had the hearing we haven't got the judgment yet I'm in the case. But what's really clear, that was, is a case about sex. And what does it mean to have the ability to make decisions about sex? What do you need to be able to understand, use, weigh, retain, in order to be able to make a decision about sex? And one of the things I would suggest, if you've got time, read the judgment. If you feel particularly enthusiastic, you can look at the hearing online. Our Supreme Court has maintains a library of previous hearings. You can look at it. And what's really obvious to me, at least, I, I should say, I came into this case very late at the Supreme Court level. And one thing which seems really obvious to me is asking questions about people's ability to make decisions about sex, for instance, is something you want to do carefully. Because if you come up with the answer that you don't think the person does have capacity, what do you do? because the criminal law becoming, becomes engaged there in very, very complicated ways. And it becomes engaged there in very, very complicated ways, both if you've got one person who has impaired decision-making capacity wanting to have sex with someone with unimpaired decision-making capacity, the other way around, or two people who might have impaired decision-making ability. It's a really, really tricky area, legally, morally, ethically. We're quite litigious in England and Wales, and we put a lot of cases before our court of protection, and we're beginning to realise some of these situations are ones where the law just does not work very well. And we've got principles which clash, and we're trying to work out how to resolve them. You're going to grapple with that. You're going to have your own experiences in Ireland as you go forward. But I wanted just to flag those four, to me, cautionary tales. I was trying to reflect on what I could share most usefully. Those are my four cautionary tales. Just very lastly, Eleanor, a couple of resources for people. If you want to see the cases I've talked about, live hyperlinks out, or that top link there, is the case or database we can keep in chambers. That's also where you can find our mental capacity report, which Anna kindly referred to. And I would just very largely flag, purely selfishly, my blog, Mental Capacity Law and Policy, which has got quite a lot of stuff on it about English mental capacity law. If you want to understand, I've got shed and ours, I've been recording from my shed about things like capacity and best interests. So that's me done, Eleanor. I think I'm within time. You are very well within time. Thank you very much, Alex, for sticking to time. That will enable us to have a little bit of time for questions at the end of this session. So I'll move on now to introduce our next speaker. So next up is Mats Jesperson. And Mats is the founder and board member of the Personal Ombuds Skjona project. And he was also one of the founding members of the European Network of Users and Survivors of Psychiatry, and in fact presented the Personal Ombuds Skjona project at the negotiations on the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities as an example of supported decision making. So I'm happy now to have Max to talk about that work that they have been doing in Sweden with this project.
Mats, if you would turn on your camera, please. Oh, is it that? No, it's that. Yes. Thank you, sir. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm uh, not very used to this. I'm a bit uncomfortable in talking in this way. I prefer to talk in front of an audience, but I hope it will work. Uh, so I, I'm going to tell you a little about our service, Pio Skåne, which means the personal ombudsman in Skåne, which is a province in Sweden. Skåne is the south, most southern province in Sweden with 1.1 million inhabitants. And we started this in 1995. So we, we have now more of a quarter of a century of experience of this. It has become well known all over, all over the world, especially in connection with the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Our service is, for example, furthered by the World Health Organization since 2011 and onwards. And there's a great interest in our service now when many countries are considering the option of abolishing their old guardianship system and replacing it with some form of supported decision making. In January 2006, I presented P.O.S. Gone in the UN headquarters in New York during the uh, drafting of the convention. And since then, I have presented it at conferences in 17 European countries and outside Europe in Japan, Peru, and Chile. And here in, in Ireland, I have presented it three times in Dublin, Galway, and Killarney. So I will start, we'll give you a short definition of what the personal ombudsman is. And I use the shortening PO is it because it's more comfortable. A PO is a professional, highly skilled person who works to 100% on the commission of his clients only. Not 97% or 98 or 99%, but 100%. The PO is in no alliance with psychiatry or the social services or any other authority and not with the client's relatives or any other person in his or her surroundings. There is no hidden agenda behind the backs of the clients. The PO does only what his clients want him to do, as it can take a long time, sometimes several months, before a client knows and dares to tell what kind of help he or she wants the PO has to wait, even though a lot of things are chaotic and in a mess. So that is one of the things we have to train the new PO's not to interact immediately. If you see things you think you must fix very quickly, but just stay calm. And this also means that the PO has to develop a long time engagement for his clients, usually for several years. This is a necessary condition for developing a trustful relation and for com coming into more essential matters. Actually, our service started 10 years before the UN Convention was adopted in another context, namely the experience of us who are users and survivors of psychiatry and our ideas of the support we think we might need in certain situations. The Swedish system with personal ombudsmen came, in, came out of the Swedish psychiatric reform in 1995. And they were, they were then set up 10 pilot projects uh, financed by the parliament directly. And I succeeded to get one of those pilot projects. Now, 26 years later, we have in Sweden 310 person ombudsman that provides supported decision making for more than 6,000 individuals. 245 municipalities, which is 84% of all municipalities in Sweden, include peers in their social service system. In 2013, we got a new regulation that includes the peer system in the regular welfare system. The peer system is actually also saving huge sums of money for the government. Studies show that PO operations reduce costs by approximately 80,000 euros per assisted person over a five-year period. 
For every one euro the government spend on the peer system, they gain 17 euros. So it's also a good business. And that is a good argument when you're arguing with politicians to get the support for introducing the service. Uh, the municipalities can choose to run the peer service themselves or contract some NGO run it for them. We think it's important that the PO service is independent from the government to avoid conflicts of interest and to gain trust from the persons who need the service most. Because there's a lot of people who have very bad experience of the government and very much distrust in it. And it is usually this, those persons who need the support most of all. Our service Pioskone is one of the biggest in the country. It is a non-governmental organization run jointly by the regional youth organization RSMA Skone and the regional family organization EFS Skone. Half of the members of the board are appointed by the youth organization and the other half by the family organization, which means that the board consists of users and family members. The board is the employer of the managing director and the 22 personal ombudsmen, which are professional persons working full time. Being a board member is a voluntary commitment, but the director and the personal ombudsman are paid with a monthly salary. The service is free for the clients. Pioskone operates as a contractor in 17 of the 33 municipalities in the province of Skone both in uh, big cities and in very rural areas. Uh, half of the funding for this service comes from the grants by the state and the other half from the local municipalities. Most of the peers are trained social workers, but there are also some who have a background as lawyers or has some similar academic education. In our service with personal ombudsmen, the most important thing has been to develop ways to work which are adjusted to persons with mental health problems of the most difficult kind. And with this, I mean, for example, people who live uh, almost completely in a symbolic world of their own, or who live uh, barricaded in their path and open the door for anybody, or people with psychiatric problems who live as homeless people in the in the streets. So that is what we first of all focus on. In other projects, it is usually the clients who have to adjust themselves to a bureaucratic system, but we work in the opposite way. The peers have to be very flexible, creative and unconventional in finding ways to work with this group. For example, there was a, a woman who hasn't opened her door for anybody, not from the social service for anybody. And the PO had to uh, be talking with her through the mail drop for one month. Uh, and she was very interested. So she replied, they had a dialogue. And after one month, she opened the door for the PO and let her in to see it just on a stool, just inside the door. But nobody has succeeded to come in into her apartment before. Uh, so now I will just briefly give some preconditions which we think are necessary if you really want to reach these persons and practice supported decision making with them. First of all, the PO doesn't work Monday to Friday at office hours only. The week has seven days and each day 24 hours and the PO must prepare to work at all these various hours because their clients problems are not concentrated to office hours and some clients are more easy to contact in evenings and weekends. The PO has to work 40 hours a week, but makes up a flexible working scheme every week according to the wishes of the clients. The PO hasn't got any office because office is power. The PO works from his own home with the help of telephone and internet, and he meets his or her clients in their home or at neutral places out in town. The PO works primarily according to a relationship model. As many clients are very suspicious or hostile or hard to reach because of other reasons, the PO has to go out and find them where they are, not just sit in the office and wait for them to come. And then he has 
to, care, to reach them through several steps. First, making contact. Two, developing co communication. Three, establishing a relation. Four, starting a dialogue. Five, getting commissions. Each of these steps can take a long time to realize. Yes, to get contact can sometimes take several months. Not until a relation is established and the dialogue has started and the PO starts getting commissions from his client. There should be no bureaucratic procedure to get the PO. If a form had to be signed or an admission note been necessary, many psychiatric patients would back out and not get the PO. And it would probably be the persons who need a PO most. To get a PO from PO Skone doesn't involve any formal procedure. After a relation is established, the PO just ask, do you want me to be your PO? If the answer is yes, the whole thing is settled. And it could be canceled just as easy if the client says, I don't want you anymore. Uh, the PO should be able to support the client in all kinds of matters. The priorities of the client are usually not the same as the priorities of the authorities or, or the relatives. A PO must must uh, be able to spend a lot of time talking with their clients about these kinds of issues and not just fix things. A PO should be well skilled to be able to argue effectively for the client's rights in front of various authorities or in court. All PO's or PO's going to have some kind of academic degree from a university or some similar education. Most of them are trained social workers, but some are lawyers and some have other specialized tra training. The client has the right to be anonymous for the authorities. If he doesn't want his PO to tell anybody that he has a PO, this must be respected. PO Skone gets money from the municipality for the service, but there is a paragraph in the contract that says that the PO could deny to tell the name of the clients to the municipality. The PO doesn't keep any records. All papers belong to the client. When the relation is terminated, the PO has either to give all papers to the client or burn them together with the client. No paper and no notes will remain with the PO. At the moment, at the moment, the PO Skone has 22 personal ombudsmen, one self-determination uh, and one, dire one director uh, working full-time and also one assistant to the director. They are employed by a board, when I already told you this. So I think I could, uh, it's time to stop there. What should I do now? That's fine. Thank you very much, Matt. Mm -hmm. uh, that was great to hear, especially about how to support people who are hard to reach and who have more complex experiences and needs for support. We've had a question in the chat about that already, and I'm sure we'll come back to that during the Q&A. So now I would like to introduce Jonathan Martinez. Uh, Jonathan is a Senior Director for Law and Policy at the Burton Blatt Institute of Syracuse University. And in this context, he's perhaps most well known for representing Jenny Hatch in the Justice for Jenny case in the US, which was the first trial to hold that a person has the right to use supported decision making to make her own life choices instead of being subjected to permanent plenary guardianship. Jonathan has now educated and trained tens and thousands of older adults, people with disabilities, families and professionals across the United States on supported decision making theory and practice. So we are delighted to welcome Jonathan to share his experience with us today. Thank you so much, Eleanor. And again, my name is Jonathan Martinez. I am with the Burton Blatt Institute. It's my honor to be here to talk about what I think is the greatest advance for civil rights for people with disabilities, not just in America, but across the world. And that is the um, supported decision-making movement growing directly out of the Article 12 of the CRPD. And yes, I know that we in America have not ratified the CRPD, but the supported decision-making movement is directly related to the values incorporated in Article 12, very much related to American values around life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, values that we received from our British uh, original uh, colonialists. So when we talk about supported decision-making, when I can talk to you 
about where we've come from, where we're going, and where perhaps you could go, I think it's important to start not with law, but culture. Because so much of where we're going will be defined by where we've been. And so much of where we've been is defined by what we have believed, not what the law says, but what people believe the law does or should say. And culture comes directly from our history. I, I always say that the whole idea of guardianship, the whole idea of the expectation that people with disabilities need someone to make decisions for them comes from Roman, ancient Rome. The Justinian Code 1500 years ago was one of the first times laws were put in one place. One of the first times we had laws that defined rights included a passage that said, if people are feeble-minded, their words, they had to have a curator put over them to make decisions for them, to do things instead of them. And that began a culture that has followed us for 1500 years, an expectation that guardianship, that supported, that that's, uh, substituted decision-making is not only legal, it is correct. And often it is the only option because it's the only one people know about. So here in America, we have had our laws shaped by that culture ever since. And even though, and I've done studies on this, even though the vast majority of American laws already say and have already said for decades that guardianship should not be ordered if there is a less restrictive alternative, unless a person is proven to be unable to make decisions, unless people are found to be incapable of making decisions. What we've seen time and time again is an expectation that people are unable, that they are incapable, and that there are no less restrictive alternatives. So that is the first lesson learned, I say, as you move into the legislative arena around supported decision-making is this. Do not think that laws alone will create a context for supported decision-making. Do not think that just creating a code will make it happen because judges are as susceptible to culture as the wider society. I am involved in several cases right now and have researched dozens of others where people were put into guardianship without any actual evidence being admitted. Literally a petition filed one day and an order putting them into guardianship the next, despite state laws saying that they are entitled to a hearing with admissible evidence before being placed in guardianship. There are now, since the Jenny Hatch case that Eleanor was so kind to associate me with, I always say it was just my honor to know Jenny Hatch, let alone represent her. But since her case, 13 states and the District of Columbia have passed laws specifically recognizing supported decision-making as an alternative to guardianship, as a preferred alternative to guardianship. And yet what we still see in those states and in all others is again a cultural expectation that guardianship is the only option. Indeed, despite laws, we find that the number one referral source for guardianship, when people are asked, what was your first push toward guardianship, is inevitably teachers. We have teachers and educational professionals telling parents, your child is going to be a legal adult at 18. Unless you get guardianship, you're not going to be able to be part of that child's life. A statement that is, by the way, both factually and legally incorrect, yet the culture leads them to believe that. We have doctors and lawyers telling parents that guardianship is the only option, that the two things they must do as their children turn 18 are one, get guardianship, and two, get social security with no discussion of other options. And even though other options like powers of attorney and a, a, a advanced directives not unlike the assisted decision-making we've seen in Britain and other countries, have been available for decades. We still find that the culture moves us towards seeking guardianship. So my first 
imploring to you is to address culture on equal basis as you address law. And that can only be done through education and outreach. We can only change minds and hearts if we reach out to them. And that is not going to be done by black letter laws on books because the vast majority of people do not have access to those laws. They do not know that those laws have passed. In our country, the vast majority of attorneys I've spoken with are not necessarily aware of the laws that are currently on the books. They just know what they have been told, what I call institutional knowledge. Someone has told someone something that has passed down to someone else, that has passed down to someone else. And when you have 1,500 years of history that passes that down, that is hard to get past. So one person at a time, one parent reached out to, one attorney educated, one judge spoken to, we have to break down that wall of culture and expectations. Otherwise, there is no law that will help us. Second lesson I think we've learned is that here in America, um, guardianship is a state law issue. So with 50 states, we have 50 different state laws. With 13 different state laws recognizing supported decision making, we have 13 different ways of recognizing what supported decision making is and what it can be. So another thing I implore you to do is to help people understand what supported decision making is because statutory language is by its very nature confusing. I am as guilty of that as anyone. The recognized textbook definition of supported decision making is something I had a hand in writing along with Professor Peter Blank and it goes like this. Supported decision making is a recognized alternative to guardianship where people with disabilities and older adults work with trusted friends, family members, and professionals who help them understand the situations and choices they face so they may make their own decisions without the need for a guardian. That is an incredibly confusing definition. And the vast majority of lay people, when they hear that, their eyes glaze or they get concerned because they know what guardianship is. They have been told about guardianship for a very long time. And when they are faced with a choice between something that they have heard of their entire life and that giant long definition that they've never heard of and that is frankly intimidating, the vast majority will go with what they know. So we need to explain supported decision-making in plain language. No matter what our statutes say, we need to find a way to explain it better. And the way that I explain supported decision-making to people is like this. How do you make decisions? What do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when you're faced on the job with a situation you've never been faced with before? What do you do when you have a relationship issue that you feel too close to and shouldn't be making that decision yourself? And what do you do when the doctor speaks jargon to you and you don't understand? The answer is simple. You ask for help. You ask the doctor to explain things in plain language. You ask a friend for advice about um, relationships. You ask a coworker or a supervisor for what to do on the job. And these are simple concepts we all understand. In fact, think of all of the cliches that we use to talk about decision-making. Here's several. Don't make a snap judgment. Get a second opinion. Make an informed decision. One of my dad's favorite statements was, if you measure twice, you only have to cut once. All of these mean the same things. Get help, get advice. Don't make snap judgments, get help making decisions. And that is what supported decision-making is. And when we explain it that way, what we're doing is we are putting older adults and people with disabilities on equal footing, truly equal footing with everyone else because you're helping everyone else understand that the things we are talking about are things that are intensely familiar to them. And with that, we are helping demystify a phrase, supported decision-making, they have never heard before. And we are helping build equality by helping people understand that the things we talk about are nothing more or less than the things that they want for themselves. Everyone wants help when they need it. 
why should we not be ensuring that people with disabilities have the same help? And with the few minutes I have left, uh, the last piece of advice I have is this. Do not put your faith in forms. What I mean is this. The very nature of supported decision-making is to enhance people's self-determination. We know from study after study after study, going back decades, that older adults and people with disabilities who have more self-determination, those who make more decisions, those who make, have more control over their lives, have better lives. We are now conducting studies, I was part of one, where we found, in fact, that people with disabilities who used supported decision-making, in fact, did have greater self-determination and did have a better quality of life. So the whole point of supported decision-making is to enhance individual control. And what concerns me are several state laws in the, in the US, not all, but several, that condition the use of supported decision-making on completing a form. And worse, the form is often statutorily mandated. In other words, you cannot be recognized as using supported decision-making unless you have filled out and completed the form contained in the statute. Now, as in some cases, the form even has to be notarized. And as I, I said to one state legislature, what is the population of your state that lives in poverty that has disabilities? It's a very high percentage. What is the percentage of people with disabilities in your state that live in rural areas? It was a high percentage. And I said, what do you think the percentage is of those people who have access to notary publics or have access to your specific statutory forms? And yet, if one of them has been using supported decision-making, not calling it that, and we must realize that the vast majority of people don't call it supported decision-making. I don't. Uh, when I use supported decision-making, when I ask people for advice, I don't use that phrase. So we must realize that people who use supported decision-making naturally have the same right to use it as people who come upon a form in a book but we're cutting them out when we require a form. We are cutting them out when we require specific methodologies and we often cut them out with the forms we use. Here's an example. One state law we have has a mandated form and that form is written in the first person to be filled out by the person with disabilities. And it is written at an above high school level, a college level of language, and comprehension. By definition, then, we are telling people with disabilities that this form is not for you. This form is not to be read by you. This form is not to be used by you. This form is to be put in front of you to sign and filled out with someone else. That is antithetical to the very self-determination that we preach. I have no objection to model forms. I think we should create model forms. We should help people identify model language that they can use and adapt in their lives. But when we require specific forms in specific ways with specific language as a condition of doing what you and I do every day, in my opinion, we are perpetuating the very separation that Article 12 was designed to eliminate. We are perpetuating the lack of life control that supported decision-making was designed to eliminate. And with that, it, let me just say one more time, it is my honor to speak with you and I'll be happy to answer any questions along with the rest of the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I think that was really enlightening, especially your focus on the need to change the culture alongside the law, if we were to have any chance of, uh, achieving the vision that Article 12 has for enabling people to self-determine and to have their autonomy respected. Okay, so I uh, want to now enter the Q&A session and we have about 10 minutes for questions. And so I see there's one already in the Q&A box and I would encourage anyone else who has a question for one of our speakers to type their question in the box. 
so there's a there's a statement or question from Martin around um, parents of children or adults with severe to profound disabilities where their family member does not have capacity to engage with any of the organizations or legal systems that we've been speaking about. How can they work their way through this labyrinth of regulation? So I might start with math. And then Jonathan, maybe, because I think you've both supported people with pretty complex um, disabilities. So maybe, Mats, if you have any advice on how to, yeah, with, without knowing the context of the Irish system in detail, I think it's still possible <laughs> to give some good solutions here. Well, I don't know if I, if I understood the question correctly, but uh, I think I already talked a little about this, that... Uh, you should, uh, people who have, because a lot of the people we are working with are people who don't ask for the support themselves. So in a way, then they would need a personal ombudsman to help them to ask for a personal ombudsman. Uh, so we have to go out and find them in different ways, all kinds of ways, all kinds of creative, creative ways. Just go out on the street and start to talk to people on a, sleeping out in the on a, on a bench or something but and but most important is that you have the time to develop a relationship uh, and that you became really like a friend that is what most of the clients say they are not just like the nurses or so because they, these are my friends and with a friend you you don't just it's not just an abstract situation where the clients say, do this, do that, because it's a dialogue, or a discussion with a, with a peer, what to, to do, and you discuss together, should I start uh, an education, for example, or whatever, so you find, you, you don't do it immediately and say, now I want that, and now I want that, but you develop like you do with the family, you talk with the people around you, and then you came to some conclusion. Well, that was a little what I was thinking about. Okay, thanks, Max. And what about you, Jonathan? What's your advice in that situation? A lot of what Matt says is, is correct about reaching people who are, by definition, incredibly hard to reach. I'd like to, to focus on people who are, however, working with particular agencies, who are working with a case manager or with someone, because that's um, not uh, someone Matt's talked about. And you are correct that people who have complex disabilities are not going to always be receptive to things that sound jargony. It's why I say that we need to change culture and expectations and speak with rather than to people. And here's what I mean by that. When we talk with people with complex disabilities, when we talk with people who, um, need higher levels of support. The first thing that I think we need to do is talk to people about what they already know. The vast, vast majority of people have already engaged in supported decision-making in some way. Again, they've not called it that. So I talk to people about choices they've already made. What are some of the things you've already done? Who are some of the people in your life right now and what do they do for you? Because once you start talking with people about what they have done, it is far easier to talk to people about what they want to do. Because something that was done successfully in the past can be adapted for future needs. So you can ask even the simplest of questions. Does someone ever give you advice about what to wear? Does someone ever give you advice about where to go, who, what to do, who to see? What are the things you like to do and who do you like to do them with? Those are the building blocks of supported decision-making because they establish relationships, like Matt said. They establish commonalities. We all have people who we like to talk to and get advice from and do things with. And when you establish that relationship, whether you are an attorney, whether you are a case manager, whether you are a formal or informal supporter, you begin to build the bridge that leads with time and with good work and good intentions to true supported decision-making. Because as I said, it's nothing more than what we all do every day anyway. All we're doing is helping people understand and I do mean the culture at large understand 
that people with disabilities have the same ability and the same right to do what everyone else does. After that, it's just finding the right mechanism. And there's a very good chance the person already knows what that mechanism is because they've already used it to make decisions before. Thanks, Jonathan. While I have you, there's another question specifically for you, uh, which is about codes of practice. So um, Niall wants to know, in the US, are there codes of practice developed for the associated sectors like finance, health, legal, that people need to engage with for services? I'm guessing codes of practice around supported decision making. Uh, largely no, but what I like to say is that the codes of practice that exist encompass supported decision making. And when I speak with doctors, doctors always tell me we can't have a supporter in the room because that violates privacy laws. We cannot have that third party there so they can't do supported decision making. What I point out to them is that the federal law in the US, it's called HIPAA says that doctors in fact may not share medical information with people unless the person gives them permission to. So a patient may say to a doctor, I want you to share information with my supporter. And just like that, the existing law encompasses supported decision-making. The law of ethics for attorneys, almost every state uh, code of ethics says that attorneys must protect attorney client privilege. But if a client is under a disability, there is nothing wrong as long as the client agrees to supporting that client to make decisions or even at the client's discretion, having a third party in the room to help the client understand the attorney and the attorney understand the client. That is the very nature of supported decision-making, even though we don't call it that. And lastly, with case managers and other professionals, there is a concept in America called person-centered planning, which is exactly as it sounds. The person is the center of his or her plan. It is the case manager, the professional's job to help that person understand what his or her options are so the person can choose them. That is in all but name supported decision-making. So the very long answer to your question is this. Even if these codes don't say supported decision-making, the concepts and values encompassed in them include, in my opinion, must include supported decision-making. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I, I, want, I see Alex has made a good uh, suggestion in the chat as well about um, some research from England and Wales that uh, shows how professionals are already involved in supported decision making. So helping them to recognize that. And I might ask you, Alex, as well about the most recent review of the code of practice um, in your context, you know, after 15 years of the Mental Capacity Act, and since you've already given us some useful warnings for uh, pitfalls we might want to avoid, what would be the main findings of that review of the code of practice uh, in terms that you know, we might want to consider in our codes of practice? I think that's a very good question, Eleanor, unsurprisingly. I think the most important thing to have in mind is you need to keep any code of practice under review. Our big problem is that we published a code before our act came into force, kind of imagining what might be going on. We've now got 14, 15 years of experience of what actually happens. And we're trying to capture all of that in one go. It would be much better if you've got the ability to look at things on an incremental basis. I'd also, I think I've got to take the opportunity to completely agree with Jonathan that the law and then statutory codes of practice are really only half the picture. I mean, most people don't read the law. Quite a few people don't read the code of practice. Quite a few people might read some form, which is half based on a code of practice. And so it's how you have continually going backwards and forwards between what's actually going on on the ground and trying to work out what's going on on the ground and then reflecting back up. But being super aware that it's just the beginning of the, the beginning of the picture passing a law, it's the beginning of a picture passing a code of practice. I think that's probably the, the most useful thing I can say based on my experience of trying to go back over and see all the different bits we're realising we should, people should have had more detail in. And then being very slightly nihilistic 
about how much you actually think you can achieve with a code of practice, as opposed to continually chivying people and continually persuading, continually cajoling, and every so often just having to have a court, for instance, say, so-and-so has got that completely wrong. It's how you continually ch try and help guide professional cultures. Great, thank you for that. And I'm sure we could talk about this for longer. I know there are still some questions unanswered in the chat, but in the interest of time, I'm going to wrap up this session and hand over to for our next session, which is due to begin right now. But again, any of the panelists, including those who are still with us from this morning, can type answers to the questions that have come up in the Q&A box. And I would encourage you to do that wherever you can so we can answer as many of these questions as possible. So thank you very much to everyone for your engagement and questions, and we'll move on now to the next session. Um, so thank you very much, Eleanor, and thank you to Jonathan, Maths, and Alex for some very interesting perspectives on other jurisdictions, uh, and also to Alex for that new term, a shedinar, uh, which I'm going to introduce uh, into my uh, language now.